You're good now, too? Yeah, I just got to get rid of this got it here that pops up every once in a while. All right, so we are ready to start then. So I'll begin by welcoming everyone to our Prescott Town meeting for Monday, November 15th. 2021, uh, we'll begin item one, the call to order by acknowledging that this meeting of council is taking place in Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples. In particular, we acknowledge the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Anishabek, and the Oneida and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, two is approval of the agenda this evening, and uh, we do have a recommendation that the agenda for the council meeting of November 15th 2020 be approved as presented, but right before we do go to that, I would ask for a quick moment of silence. We've lost uh, uh, two big members of the community recently in Candy Alexander and Ralph Street, both uh, strong members of Prescott, volunteered for many, many activities. And I'd like to just begin with a, a moment of silence uh, tonight for, for losing two very, very dedicated Prescottonians. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so we will proceed with the approval of tonight's agenda. A recommendation reads that the agenda of the council meeting of November 15th, 2021 be approved as presented. Could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Ostrander, seconded by Councilor McConnell. Any comments, questions on tonight's agenda? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Item three, declarations of interest. Any uh, declarations from members of council this evening? Seeing no, uh, we have nothing under four presentations or delegations tonight under five, six minutes of the previous council meetings. And uh, we do have under 6.1, uh, that's the minutes from November 1st, 2021, our last council meeting, of course. Recommendation reads that the council minutes dated November 1, 2021 be accepted as presented. Uh, could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Burton, seconded by Councilor Young. Any discussion on that set of minutes from <clears throat> our last meeting? Uh, seeing no, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. Uh, seven communications and petitions, nothing tonight. Eight consent reports. Uh, we do just have the information package listed there. Is, is, does anyone want to uh, separate any items in the consent reports this evening to speak to individually? Uh, seeing no, then the recommendation reads that all items listed under the consent report section of the agenda be accepted as presented, and that includes, of course, the information package under separate cover. Could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Young, seconded by Councilor Ostrander. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Thanks, everyone. That is carried. Uh, nine committee reports, uh, nothing tonight because we have had no committee meetings. Uh, 10 mayor's portion of the evening. I'll go over really quickly. Uh, been actually quite a busy last uh, couple of weeks. I will note uh, we did secure a meeting with our border mayor's group uh, on Friday, November 12th with the new minister of public safety, uh, Marco uh, Mendicino. It's a good meeting. Uh, all the, uh, the mayors on board were, were quite united in our call for, uh, uh, for uh, changes to the existing uh, regulations involving the, uh, the, the testing. Uh, basically, and we, we outlined exactly what we talked about here about a month ago, I believe, when I brought that motion forward, and we passed at our council. A number of other municipalities have now passed similar or almost identical uh, uh, resolutions to what we've passed. A big support in that meeting, particularly from southwestern Ontario, uh, the city of Windsor, Niagara Falls, and uh, and also Sarnia have been, been real leaders down there. They've been working with other uh, counterparts across the border and uh, in and around the Buffalo area, most notably uh, uh, U.S. Representative Brian Higgins, who's really been leading the way in the U.S. side. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Minister Mendicino was a good meeting. Uh, he did not have any uh, real information to offer to us other than to confirm that they are looking at the policy and there are possibilities that things will be changed 
in the not too distant future. He didn't confirm anything, uh, but with regards to the potential of an announcement on the 21st of the month or by the 21st, uh, because that is, of course, been the traditional date that uh, uh, they've had the, the announcements of the extension of the border closings and changes and so forth. So there is a possibility something could come forward in the next little bit with regards to the 21st. I do see, though, that the, uh, the federal conservatives have uh, gotten into this as of, I believe, uh, it was late Friday or early Saturday, uh, they've released a statement now calling for changes to that uh, PCR testing as well at the border. So now it's, you know, it could get a little political, but uh, at any rate, with the mayor's group has uh, as, uh, stayed its ground here and is, is advocating uh, for uh, the removal of that testing and some, some serious adjustments there. Because quite frankly, what, they, what they're doing right now presents a real barrier to, to people crossing that border. $200 plus uh, for that, that uh that molecular test. There's also, of course, the fact that uh, the test can be done in Canada before leaving for the US and does not have to be repeated upon arriving back in Canada, as long as you're within that 72 hour window. There, there are just a lot of holes in the government policy there and hopefully they will uh, look, look at some serious changes in the not too distant future. So anyways, there is a little bit of movement there in regards to the dialogue. Hopefully we'll hear more in the not too distant future. I uh, want to, of course, acknowledge Remembrance Day on uh, November 11th, of course, uh, thank our Legion for doing such an outstanding job again with the, uh, with the service at the Cenotaph and uh, a small reception afterwards uh, in, the, in the Legion Hall. Things were limited again this year uh, due to uh, COVID. Uh, just you know, underline that this you know, wasn't a municipal decision on this. This was a uh, uh, region, uh, the regional, I think the district, I think uh, had this again in place uh, just with regards to COVID. Hopefully this will be the last year. And despite that, we did have, you know, I think well over a hundred people showed up at the Cenotaph and it was, it was quite well, uh, well uh, attended uh, despite COVID with people you know, wearing masks, social distancing and so forth. So again, as always, I want to thank our Legion for all they do for us every day, but particularly on and around uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, had our uh, regular meeting of the St. Lawrence Quarter Economic Development Commission on uh, Wednesday, November 10th. Uh, really good meeting, uh, and there's a big announcement coming in the next not, not too distant future with regards to, uh, I, I will say, one of the largest uh, industrial uh, uh, news about industry coming to the area that we've had in, in quite some time, and uh, that, that will go public very, very shortly. That was received by the group on, on Wednesday, so stay tuned for some some real good economic news for, uh, for the entire region coming forward. And that's through our partnership with the corridor, which uh, quite frankly is really starting to pay major dividends now uh, for the entire region. So stay tuned on that one. Wish I could say more, but this is uh, a controlled by the industries in question and there will be something uh, forthcoming very soon. Uh, we had an economic development meeting here at Town Hall as well uh, with uh, Councilman Jansman, myself, uh, Dana Valentine and, uh, and uh, Matt Armstrong uh, just going over uh, current economic development opportunities and so forth. There'll be a fuller report coming to council in the not too distant future as well, just to update everyone on where we stand with uh, some of the property purchases and uh, the work being uh, undertaken right now by the, by the number of, uh, of industries we've got coming into the north end and some other opportunities else, elsewhere in town. So good full sum update will be coming to all of council uh, very soon. I want to thank Councillor Jansman for uh, attending that meeting uh, in, in her capacity as our ECDEV chair as well. So it will be out to everyone as soon as soon as uh, we can get that uh, update back to staff, back from staff. Attended the BIA meeting on Tuesday, November 9th. And I'll also note uh, Tuesday, November 9th, I attended our joint services uh, meeting uh, virtually with uh, all our partners with the United Counties. You may have seen the, uh, the newspaper coverage on that. Uh, the big news out of that meeting was the release of the homelessness uh, study for Leeds Grenville that did quite clearly show that the uh, the center of the homelessness issue in Leeds Grenville does seem to be Brockville with a, a little bit spreading uh, out to, uh, to to its other communities like ourselves along uh, along the St. Lawrence Corridor along that north shore of the 401. Uh, it's something I, I, I've been questioning all along with regards to our commitment uh, to uh, to the dollars for the homelessness shelter support out to North Grenville and Nothing against North Grenville, but I, I, I will I'll repeat the argument now that we've got the, the numbers that the, the real problem does seem to be much closer to home here uh, in the Prescott area, largely centered, of course, in Brockville, as the study showed. So that is something I think we need to, to look at uh, more thoroughly. And I'll note that we do have a meeting coming up on Wednesday morning of our uh, housing task force. That's uh, ourselves, again, in Aukway, Brockville, and all the United Counties uh, mayors. It's basically the entire Joint Services Group. We're finally at the point where we've got the full recommendations coming off uh, of the report that that group commissioned. Uh, we will be looking uh, for uh, the uh, committee's approval on hiring 
a new uh, new housing administrator to look after uh, just basically the housing file overall. And this includes both affordable housing and what we we're looking at calling attainable housing. So it's actually gonna, gonna sort of tackle this uh, serious crisis from a number of directions, focused on uh, the supports needed to strengthen the affordable housing file, but also to, to work at uh, just bringing housing uh, developers into the area, improving the housing stock overall and making sure that uh, we have enough housing out there that the prices actually, well, they naturally come down with, with added stock and also to see what we can do to uh, encourage uh, that attainable housing. So we can, we, we can uh, make sure that we don't have a, a whole generation that uh, will have to abandon the dreams of home ownership. That's something that we've really got to, to, to get on. And it's something I, I will say briefly, just for our own purposes, I think the housing file needs to be absolutely at the top of our list uh, going, going forward. I think there will be some recommendations in there with regards to the study that we're uh, uh, is just being finished up now by staff, what we're doing with Augusta. And I just would encourage everyone to take a real good look at the housing file and uh, you know, spare some real thought on what we can do to help encourage more uh, housing development in and around Prescott and, of course, working with our county's partners. Because this is the, the biggest crisis I think we're going to deal with. And it's going to hamstring, and it was already hamstringing, uh, industries in, 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 in terms of getting their new employees and expansion. Uh, so we can't, this is, uh, this is a problem that's going to really damage us uh, economically, and it's already causing issues we, we've seen with the homelessness issue, addictions, mental health, and so forth. So this is something we really, really need to take a look at, uh, both with our county's partners and also internally. It's a good time to do it with the official plan uh, uh, review coming forth uh, shortly and what we're doing with uh, with uh, with Augusta with that uh, that economic development study. So anyways, uh, enough for me th this evening, but I did want to note the housing file and encourage everyone to take a, take a, a real good look at uh, what we can do and uh, what, well, quite frankly, what we need to do in the near future to address that because it, it has become such a serious crisis. Uh, at any rate, uh, I'll move on uh, from uh, from item 10 this evening, the mayor's uh, uh, comments and uh, start with 11 outside boards, committees, and commissions, and start as always with Councilor Burton. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Um, our town staff have been very busy cleaning up uh, our streets as uh, over the weekend, I think most of the leaves from the trees that were hanging on um, have fallen, so the roads are uh, quite uh, covered with a lot of leaves. And uh, just to remind everybody to uh, that our parking um, on the streets at night um, is not, uh, you're not able to do that anymore because winter is coming. And um, the shade sails, I did see um, they were up at Riverwalk Park today. They look really good. And I know they're not going to be staying up there long, um, but it's a good, uh, a good test for them right now before uh, the snow flies. So we'll uh, enjoy them in the in the spring when they're put back up. Um, and the ARENA fundraising committee will be meeting uh, tomorrow night at 6.30. So uh, lots of positive things happening there. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Burton. Uh, definitely a lot of activity on that, on that ARENA site too. I just drove by late this afternoon and they're really, uh, really getting a lot of work in there before they lose the weather completely. So great to see. I know we've got a further report on that coming up this evening. Uh, Councilor Jansman, please. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Our uh, BIA met this past uh, week on November 9th and a very, very productive meeting. The staff reports were uh, well received and our BIA will definitely make our upcoming Christmas season very, very festive. So uh, a very engaging uh, meeting for sure. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jansman. Uh, Councillor McConnell, please. Thank you, Mayor Todd. I attended a Shakespeare board meeting last week, which uh, was helping to plan the future for Shakespeare and um, touching on the success of the production that they brought in last, uh, last August. Um, I attended the um, Remembrance Day services along with yourself and other counselors um, on the 11th. And uh, it was another cool day, shall I say, cool and damp, but uh, it was nice to see some people come out for that. Um, 
I have <laughs> two meetings this week. Unfortunately, one of them just got canceled today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the second one coming up. I was down doing a little bit of painting at our new um, uh, <laughs> I keep wanting to say antique store uh, down street. It actually is an antique store, really, because it's got a lot of Prescott antiques in it. But of course, it's our uh, museum. Oops. It's our museum that we're going to be opening uh, at the end of the month. And that's coming along very nicely down there. Our staff has been doing great guns and uh, kudos to former councillor Lossinger uh, for what he's doing there as well. Um, I also have noticed the sunshades going up. Uh, I've had several compliments on them, although I've had several people wondering why we're putting them up this time of year. But uh, I've explained that uh, they have been very, very late coming in and have to be put up and tested before the end of the year uh, to qualify for the grant that they paid for most of them. Um, other than that, I haven't got much going on, Mayor Todd, so uh, I'll pass that along to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, and uh, moving along to uh, Councilor Ostrander tonight. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, not a lot going on myself, but uh, a couple of community events coming up that uh, are of interest. Uh, this Saturday at the Leo is the uh, Kinsman Craft and Christmas Show, I guess you could say. And it uh, takes the place of the former South Granville High School one that was always a huge event just before Christmas. And uh, they're, they've got a full house as far as uh, tables occupied. And so I, I would expect it's going to be somewhere near the equivalent of the, uh, of the former uh, South Grenville one at the high school. Um, our uh, Showtime South Grenville also a week from uh, Saturday at 27th, uh, we're having the concert at uh, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church with uh, Chris Coyier and Alex Florio. And um, we, we have tickets, myself and other members of the, uh, of the group. So uh, you'll see some posters around town for that. And we've also lobbied in Brockville for uh, a little outside interest in it as well. So here's hoping. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Councilor Shankar, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I did attend the Legion on a Remembrance Day and it was well, well put on, even though uh, they weren't really looking for the public to come in uh, to the Legion, but they still had a nice little reception there, which was, it's always nice to see the veterans and, and those that have served. Um, I know there's a report coming later in the meeting, but uh, Councillor Dill Dillabon and I took a bus ride a couple of weeks ago. We went from Johnstown and Prescott to Brockville on the new River Road bus. Talked to quite a few uh, passengers on the bus, uh, stopped, went for lunch and then came back. And through the day, like through the two bus rides, we between the two of us, we saw 16 different passengers. So that was probably a, a, a good day overall, looking at the report that we got where I think the, the best number we had was 20 or, or so. So it is being used. It's being used for multiple different reasons. Uh, people going to work, people going shopping, people seeing uh, health profession, professionals in, in Brockville. Uh, the one thing that I didn't know that I learned was that they will give you a transfer when you get there and you can jump on any other bus and there's no charge within Brockville. So even though you're being dropped off at the superstore or um, right on the corner there, that you can still um, access the rest of Brockville. So that is something that I wasn't aware of and, and I thought that's good to know because that's, a, that's a, an extension really of more places that you can visit within Brockville. Um, other than that, we've got our arena fundraising and I think that's going really well. Uh, as I, as Councilor Burton said, and and no complaints so far about the shade sales, so that's good. Let's take them down before anyone complains. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Corey. Uh, Councilor Young, please. Thank you, Brett. And uh, no committee reports and uh, no bus rides taken. 
Thanks, Ray. Uh, thanks everyone for the updates. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, 12 staff this evening. We've got a, uh, it's gotta be close to a record if it's not number of staff reports tonight. Uh, starting off with 12.1, that's staff report 107-2021. Uh, that's employee service uh, recognition. And I'll turn that over to uh, Ms. Veltkamp uh, for a quick review of the staff report. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Todd. Uh, as the report outlines, in 2018, Council passed a policy for employee uh, service recognition. Um, the policy was put in place in order to recognize employees for dedication and years of service. Uh, and as an attachment to the report, you'll see quite a few names. And that's because this is the first year that we've actually made an announcement of them. So. Uh, milestones being recognized are five year, 10 year, 15, 20, and 30 years of service. And I wasn't quite sure, I'm not sure if I'm putting you on the spot, Mayor Todd, but I didn't know if you wanted to read out the names or if, if we just wanted to say that they are included in the report. Uh, yeah, we can we can read them off. I'm happy to, it's not that big of a list, so I can take that. Uh, 30 years, we've got Susan Kalo and Jane McGuire from the library, Gary Minkhorst, as well with our uh, town uh, public works staff. Uh, 20 years, uh, Bob Dixon and uh, for Public Works as well, and uh, and Linda Doris from the library. Uh, we might want to check on the Linda one though, if that's uh, if that's uh, concurrent service or because she was actually at the library for quite a while before that. Uh, so I don't know if it adds up or because uh, she she was there. I I would say she'd be more than more than 30. I don't know if we want to we want to date Linda, but she started and uh, she left the town for a little while there. So. Uh, but anyways, that's a still long service. And 10 years, uh, we have uh, Phil Burton, Tracy Day, Nancy Lavalley, Matt McCaw, Susan Vallum, Dion Wilcott, Andrew Wilson, uh, from all different departments, really, really with the town. Uh, and five years, we've got uh, Matthew Armstrong, Ben Bowden, Jessica Crawford, Tyler Duclo, Caitlin Mallory, Phil Somerville, Scott Stevenson, and Lindsay Velkamp. So Great, uh, great to recognize everyone. Congratulations, to all named, and thanks so much uh, for your service, whether it be 5, 10, 20, or, or, or 30 years. It's uh, much appreciated and on behalf of everyone here at Council and all those in the town of Prescott. Thanks so much. So that was just presented for, uh, for information purposes. If uh, anyone else had any comments, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor though. If anyone did have anything else they'd like to add to that this evening. Seeing none, thanks very much everyone. 12.2 uh, at staff report 108-2021 COVID grant program for nonprofit organizations. Recommendation uh, tonight is that council approve the COVID grant program for nonprofit organizations up to a maximum of $23,520 to help support the fixed costs of those organizations for 2021. Uh, could I ask for a mover, please? Uh, moved by, I'll pick Councilor Ostrander and seconder, I'll pick Councilor Burton. Uh, a lot of hands went up all at once there. So I'll turn it over to uh, staff, Matt, I believe that is you if I remember right. So uh, Mr. Armstrong, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So Back in uh, 2020, we provided $30,000 for a COVID grant program for nonprofit organizations. Uh, we paid out $30,000. In the first six months, uh, we again resurrected the program in 2021, and we only paid out $6,480. So we're bringing it back um, again for the total amount of $30,000, which is simply the $6,480 plus the $23,520 and providing uh, that application uh, period again, uh, starting tomorrow and ending uh, just before our uh, first council meeting in um, December. So that, that way decisions can be made in December. Uh, we will um, obviously uh, put that out uh, through social media as well as sending it to all of the past recipients and the organizations that uh, we would uh, normally see as qualifying. And uh, that would be our, our intention for advertising. And this amount uh, is coming from uh, uh, COVID funding from the province of Ontario. There was $66,935 received uh, for the 2021 uh, budget year. And so uh, we decided when we were uh, finishing the budget that we would put that aside, not allocated as part of the budget. And uh, before you this evening is uh, several programs that we're putting forward to, uh, to try and uh, spend that money in a, a way that 
uh, provides the most benefit for all of our residents and businesses in the town of Prescott. And really that was uh, our focus on a lot of our COVID funding uh, spending over the last year and a half or two years. So I'm um, really happy to bring this uh, forward this evening and uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. We'll open it up for comments, questions from members of council this evening. Uh, Councilor Burton, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matthew, for the report. I think this is an, another good example that um, the municipality is, is helping organizations that are struggling. So I would encourage those organizations to um, apply and uh, to see if, uh, if we can help them out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Burton. Any other comments, questions uh, tonight from members of council? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, to everyone. And 12.3 is staff report 109 2021. That's an update on the arena construction timeline. Uh, recommendation is just information here tonight, but I'll invite Mr. Richard to uh, speak to some of the key points in uh, his report and give us an update on the arena construction. Nathan? Matt, whoever's taking it. Yeah. So I'll take the first crack at it. And then uh, for anything specific, we also have uh, Josh Eamon here from EVB and uh, Nathan and myself will uh, attempt to answer any questions it might be. So uh, as, as we well know, the um, it, we received $9.7 million in uh, provincial and federal funding uh, for the creation of the recreation complex. Uh, it was um, uh, tendered and uh, the winning bid was from Borgon and Associates and uh, that tender bid was approved by council on July 26. Uh, since then, we uh, are happy to say that we've broken ground and uh, are making uh, really good strides and, uh, and being able to bring that forward. Uh, in the first part of the uh, discussions after Borgon uh, was uh, awarded the contract, it, they did highlight some concerns around uh, just the um, current uh, slowdown uh, for some materials, in particular the steel. Uh, so we have two components. One is the structural steel of the building, so the, the great big uh, beams that you see uh, that run from one side to the other. And the other is the more structural steel, so what you would see um, be kind of behind the walls and uh, in the lobby area, that sort of thing. So with uh, those two in mind, uh, they uh, presented a, a schedule that, uh, that we've had a fair amount of discussion on and uh, to make sure that uh, we can make it. The original tender called for a completion in February. Uh, this most uh, recent schedule calls for a completion in May. And so um, trying to find out exactly, um, you know, how we can, can best manage that. And we appreciate the fact that Borgon did look at uh, changing the uh, sequence of events so that they can start to do some of the flooring work, um, the concrete slabs, that sort of thing, uh, even before the, the structural steel arrives. So um, all of those things were, were taken into account. And uh, I think that's the, the best information in the schedule that we have uh, at this moment. That being said, the um, things never cease to, to amaze. Uh, and I think uh, we can all see even in what you're seeing in stores right now with the supply chain issues, uh, both not only um, you know, nationally, locally, regionally, uh, but internationally and globally as well, is that uh, there, there is a significant issue with supply chain uh, right now. So we're, we're making every effort. And one of the things that um, we wanted to, to make sure that we add to our, our regular construction uh, review uh, meetings is how are we progressing with all of those uh, type of materials that we need to secure and so that we can get ahead of anything that might uh, uh, cause a, a slowdown in the construction uh, timeframe. So today we haven't uh, had anything that, uh, that has popped out of the woodwork, but certainly we're uh, maintaining our uh, focus on that because uh, the last thing we want to do is uh, come back to council and say it's uh, delayed further. So. Um, with all of that said, more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions there might be. I did want to point out that um, the, the site preparation, parking lot preparation, footings and foundations uh, will be uh, mostly completed uh, between now and uh, probably late uh, November, early December. Then the, uh, the project site itself will go into a bit of a, a hiatus. 
And uh, while we uh, finished the shop drawings uh, and the ordering of materials, and then I believe back in uh, March, um, right towards the beginning of March, that the site will come back up, uh, become very active again, and then it will stay active until uh, its completion in, in May of 2023. Uh, because there there is no uh, structural steel uh, coming and, uh, and the, or the conventional steel, uh, then uh, doing concrete work in the middle of winter, uh, as I think we can attest to with the water treatment plant, is not uh, the uh, greatest thing to do. And so uh, that's why there is that planned hiatus. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that the project is delayed. It doesn't mean that the um, there's any issues. It simply is part of the scheduling and the uh, programming that we're we're working on. So. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, the, the rest of the schedule is outlined uh, in the report and more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, Nathan, anything to add to that you'd like to uh, toss in before I move over to Josh? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, I, so far the project has uh, gone quite smoothly. Um, and uh, some of the things that we did discuss is um, and Josh can probably elaborate on a more technical basis, but making sure that we are protecting the work that's been done appropriately over the winter time. Um, yeah, everything's gone pretty smooth to date. Some good people working on the site, and, and uh, I think a, a lot of work's being done, even though it's in the ground and you don't really see a whole lot coming up yet. It's uh, a tremendous amount of work's been done over the last couple months since they've been on the site. Thank you, uh, Mr. Richard. Uh, Josh, anything to add? And uh, thanks uh, for joining us tonight. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, no, I, as usual, uh, Matthew and, and Ethan did a great job summarizing it. Um, you know, I thought we just thought it would be important to get in front of council and let you know that although there, you're going to see some activity slowing down on site, um, it's not because we're uh, we're not working. It's just there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, and we're waiting for our material to uh, to get to the site so that we can start moving again. We, unfortunately, that the steel framing and the and the steel structure is. Uh, you know, the next critical step and we're, we're having to wait for it to come in just due to the, the supply chain shortages and, and steel shortages in particular that we're, we're dealing with. So, yeah. And probably not a huge surprise to anyone who's been watching uh, just the way the world works these days, there, there are delays on pretty much everything. So mm -hmm. this is probably not a big surprise to anyone, even though it is a little disappointing. It's not like we really didn't, didn't see this coming and it's only Looking at it now, it's slippage of a couple of months. It's not the end of the world, but uh, it's just something you got to deal with in the reality of 2021, 2022. So open it up for comments, questions from uh, members of council this evening. Uh, uh, please uh, go ahead. Council McConnell. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Um, given the fact we've been discussing the steel structure, the framing, the big steel girders, uh, where's that steel coming from? Is it Canadian? Is it American? It's American. It's the, the supplier. There's a, a, a number of, of um, pre-engineered building suppliers, and, and this particular one is coming from American Building Systems out of uh, Georgia. I see. Uh, second question, if I may, and this I guess will likely be for either Nate or Matthew. It's a related question. We have the water tower that's going to go in adjacent to the rink and the uh, plumbing, so to speak, is going to be feeding the two of them. Given the fact that that is scheduled to be done from July to October, I believe it is of, of next year, um, will that have any effect on the timeline for our water tower? Or um, if there's another steel issue, I presume it's going to be a steel water tank we're doing this this time rather than cement. Uh, is that something that is going to greatly affect uh, our water tank? Because it does have a finite uh, lifetime. So, uh, Josh uh, and Nathan can correct me if I'm incorrect, but uh, I'm going to take a stab at this. So, we will have installed the uh, water mains and uh, that sort of thing as part of this project. Uh, so that uh, we don't have to tear the parking lot back up. Um, that's kind of the, the first one. Uh, our intended um, construction timeline is 2023 for the water tower. So just as this pro project is finishing, that one should begin. And, uh, and we want to make sure that all of the, the necessary work was already done uh, so that we didn't have to disturb anything 
that was already in place uh, in terms of parking lot or uh, that sort of thing. Then in terms of uh, when we would actually go to tender, we would go to tender in 2022. And uh, my understanding is it will be concrete and composite um, construction. And so, um, but there is obviously a steel component to, in terms of rebar, that sort of thing. Uh, but because we have such a, a large uh, timeline between kind of tendering in 2022 and construction 2023, then uh, I wouldn't expect uh, that uh, to be uh, a hindrance uh, when we get to that in 2023. And we also have that grant application. Uh, and just for everyone's knowledge on that way, yes, I, I checked that with Matt a few weeks ago. There's what is it next spring, Matt? They're not they're not actually announcing the uh, the successful grant applicants till was it March, April or thereabouts, which is odd. I'm I'm actually quite surprised it's that late in the construction season. Uh, but my understanding on. is that uh, the uh, grant will be applicable sometime in or announced uh, sometime in uh, late winter, uh, so in the March time frame, and uh, then uh, hopefully we're successful. And uh, if not, then then certainly it it doesn't change the the timing. We still have to uh, to address the water tower in uh, in that 2023 time frame. Yeah, everyone should know out there that if we don't get the grant funding, we we have the the ability, the wherewithal to do it on our own. Uh, we'd rather not do that, obviously, if the money's available, but it is going ahead and it, it is on the, we're, we're right on the schedule that we've always been on with this. It, it hasn't been dependent on the arena or it's it's worked out really well that it, they're connected, uh, but uh, the water tower is right at the top of the, uh, the list as well and infrastructure projects to be done. Uh, the arena hasn't taken precedence or anything like that. So hopefully we'll, we'll be successful on that grant, but you know, more clarity on that. Uh, as we get into next year. Uh, any other uh, comments, questions uh, from members of council? Not seeing none. So uh, thanks very much uh, to all three of you for the, for the update on that. And uh, we will look uh, for uh, the, the work on the site to sort of wind down in the, the weeks to come. So they've been pouring a lot lately and really getting through the, the concrete. They were heavily on the site. They're actually still there tonight after, after five, there were a couple of trucks still there. So they're really, uh, working hard now against uh, against the uh, the winter weather that we know is coming. So great to see how much prep work has been done. There's been a tremendous amount of activity has happened back there, as I think it was Nathan that mentioned it. You got to really kind of look at the site a little more to realize just how much has been done because it's been ground level and below, but it's a lot of extensive prep work. And when the site reopens in the spring, things are going to happen very quickly there. Uh, and, and, and you're going to see a, a real impact in, in, in the not too distant uh, future. So Going, going well, and thanks again, gentlemen, for all your work on that. And thanks to everyone at Borgon for, uh, for their efforts uh, with their local subcontractors as well. So getting closer and closer to our great new rank. Thanks, thanks again for the update tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Take care. See you later. Uh, so 12.4 is staff report 110-2021. And uh, back to uh, the bus uh, that uh, Gory mentioned earlier. So we've got an update on the River Route uh, uh, bus run on the pilot project. Uh, Matthew, I believe uh, this is yours. Recommendation is just for, this is just for information tonight, but please take us through uh, the highlights and uh, what are we seeing with the river route so far? Thank you very much. So we started the river route on August 30th. Um, it's comprised of 11 stops between the four municipalities. And uh, as Councillor uh, uh, Chankar mentioned, is that uh, you, you can uh, start here in Prescott, get to, to Brockville. And one of the features is that they give you a transit uh, transfer to one of the other buses. So it's a, it's a great way for anyone in the outlying communities to be able to get to Brockville or anywhere from Brockville to be able to get to the outlying communities. So it's, a, it's gone very well so far in terms of the partnership between the four municipalities. Uh, City of Brockville can't say enough about uh, how um, accommodating their staff has been and, and being able to uh, take people that, uh, that don't run a, um, a transit system, listen to our concerns, uh, be able to address them and, and move them forward. So through the first two months, uh, through the end of October, there were 457 rides that, uh, that were taken. Um, that in the month of October, there were 12.3 uh, passengers per day on average. Uh, we, our goal is to build the ridership between 20 and 30 passengers per day. And we can see that in the September timeframe, we were about 9.1 and then we're at 12.3. So we are moving in the right direction on that. Um, to date, the highest number of riders we've had per day is 25. And there's been more than five days 
uh, or there's been five days with 20 or more passengers uh, on them. And as Councillor Shankar mentioned, uh, with the day that he rode uh, with uh, his uh, fellow councillor from another uh, municipality, it, it wasn't over 20 days. So, uh, so that's great news. We also have observed that about two thirds of the passengers are uh, in the morning and uh, up to about one o'clock. And so uh, that's just a, another observation that we're, we've been taking a look at. So what we have determined thus far is, is really when you, when you talk about technology or you talk about change, um, or about uh, you know, adopting an, a new thing, that there, there's a very um, uh, regular pattern of how people uh, accept things and, and that change. And so what we're seeing right now is those early adopters, um, those that are saying, yep, no, I'm comfortable with taking the bus. I, 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 this fits into my life well and, and I can move it forward. So what we're, we now wanna transition to is the, what we'll see is the general adoption. And so part of that is our marketing will start to uh, focus on stories and, and very much uh, Councillor Shankar's story is I got on at this place, I was able to get to Rockville, I got a transfer ticket, I was able to go to lunch or have a coffee and then this is how I was able to get home and this is how I paid and that sort of thing. So it starts to remove some of those things that might make people nervous of how do I pay for this? How do I, uh, you know, how do I know where I'm going to stop? How do I know where I'm going and how do I get back? And so that's really what is going to be the focus of our marketing as we move forward is being able to remove some of those barriers or just those mental um, things that people have to overcome in order to say, yep, yeah, I'm going to be comfortable trying out the bus today. Uh, and with that, we're also going to put out uh, two public surveys. One is a survey to the businesses in the four communities, uh, trying to gauge um, kind of that original uh, survey that we issued and saying, you know, how many people would be uh, interested in this and, and be able to adopt it or use it. And then now that we have it in place, you know, how are we meeting those needs and uh, how can we uh, even get more employees uh, on to the, to the bus? The other survey will be just a, a general uh, public survey. And it's really for residents to say, do, it, do I know about it? Have I used it? And if I haven't used it, what are some of the barriers? Is it timing? Is it uh, uh, where the stop is? You know, those types of things. And so really, so that way, before we make any changes, we can start to, to really get that feedback and understand how we can best uh, tweak it to, to meet their needs and ultimately grow the number of people that are using the bus on a daily basis. And then finally, uh, we did take a look and we have uh, per stop data and 17% of riders are either picked up or dropped off in Augusta Township. Uh, 36% of riders are in Edwardsburg Cardinal uh, Township, and then 47% uh, are either dropped off or picked up in Prescott. So um, as you can see, we're almost uh, at the 50% mark. And so uh, for the total ridership, so that certainly is a, a thing to think about. Uh, we're seeing quite a few uh, people from Prescott embracing it and uh, being able to use it. So that's fantastic news. In terms of alternatives, uh, there's, there's none at this time. Our intention is to run uh, the full six months, which would bring us to the end of February. And after the first uh, nine weeks, uh, we've spent $27,803 on staffing, fuel and maintenance costs. This is a slightly ahead of budget in terms of about $2,900, uh, but we will monitor this in November and December. In terms of revenue uh, from ridership, that's about $2,764 to the end of October. And we, in terms of how we patterned uh, that, uh, we expected it to be low uh, as we're building uh, that ridership in September, October, November, and then it will. Uh, we should be reaching uh, our goal and surpassing it in the December, January, February timeframe of 20 to 30 passengers per day. So we've already begun the process of exploring permanent sources of revenue, and that could include um, the provincial gas tax funding. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities is certainly supportive of rural transportation and uh, innovative ways to get people to work, as well as uh, just general uh, transportation. Uh, the Ministry of Transport of Ontario and then the federal government. Um, both of the federal government and provincial government have uh, shown a willingness to uh, look at rural transportation, support it, and really that's uh, some, those are the, the four groups that we're going to go after and, uh, and try and secure funding for a longer period of time. 
we fully realize that funding will be um, at the top, one of the top things on the list in terms of uh, can we support this moving beyond the pilot stage? And so we want to be able to answer some of those uh, questions for you and have a solid plan of how we can continue this after February of 2022. And we will be coming to council in January of 2022 to help uh, start to answer some of those questions. It aligns fairly well with our budgeting uh, cycle. Um, I've uh, had a brief uh, discussion with uh, Brockville in terms of their ability to continue past that time frame, and uh, and they, um, from a staff perspective, seem willing to do so. They're receiving this report, I believe, uh, tomorrow evening, and Edwardsburg Cardinal is receiving it uh, tonight or tomorrow evening, and uh, Augusta will be receiving it next week. So wanted to make sure everyone had the same bit of information. We were taking stock after our two months. Now we're taking a look and to see uh, from the public as well as the business sector is how we can tweak it and then being able to say, you know, if this is something that, that we want to continue and, uh, and then we feel that it is worthwhile, then how do we make that a permanent uh, uh, type of uh, program and uh, be able to support it fully as we move forward. So that's the report in a nutshell and uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matt. Uh, great report. And I've I've got to say, well, the, well, the numbers aren't exactly uh, going to knock anybody's socks off. It's still very impressive considering the circumstances with the pandemic, uh, with the fact that, you know, there are just some people that wouldn't want to travel that way right now with regards to COVID. Uh, I think it's been, been, been it's really shown indications that this is going to be a long-term thing and it's going to be successful, but we do have to commit ourselves to it and moving it beyond the pilot project stage. I know just speaking for myself, I'm all in for this. I know Councillor Jansman, she made that a, that was a major part of her getting on council uh, a couple of terms ago was uh, with a public uh, public transit. And uh, I also want to make sure I thank, uh, as always, the city of Brockville, because this doesn't happen without, without Brockville. And this all started a few years ago when uh, Mayor, former Mayor Jason Baker called me and said, you, you, you want transit? I've got, uh, we've got some funding, we've got some availability. And it just kind of grew from there. So that's, uh, it shows the power of regionalism and, and how we can you know, bring these services on board if we're all willing to work together. And the only real concern I would have with all of this is, you know, there's been a couple people in Edwardsburg Cardinal Council that have been sort of doubtful about this all along. It's great to see uh, Councilor Dillaba out there. And I know we've got uh, tremendous support from the Deputy Mayor, Tori Deschamps as well. It's, it's great to see uh, uh, Steve out there with uh, with with Gory uh, riding out there and really promoting it. Uh, they had it out on social media, getting the awareness out. I mean, that's great stuff. But uh, but I am concerned about about you know the, the ongoing participation beyond the pilot. But it's nice to see that thirty six percent in Edwardsburg Cardinal. I mean, it makes sense because Brockville Cardinal and Prescott would be the urban centers that it would stop at. So I just I just hope they really take a good look at the numbers and uh, they're going to continue to work with us because I think this is got tremendous potential for the region and even expanding beyond this once we get clear of the pilot project. And what I think are really, you need 18 to 24 months to really get something like this up and running. And there is, uh, there are obviously are provincial dollars available. So anyways, I won't go any on any longer. I just wanted to, to mention the city of Brockville primarily and and uh, thank the staff for this this great report and thank Gory and, uh, and, and Steve too for their work in promoting it. Because I think we've got something special here, but we're going to have to Shepherd it along. Anyways, I'll open it up for comments, questions from members of council. Well, that was fast. Oh, sorry, Councillor Jasmine, please. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Um, also too, which is uh, good news, it's only been recently, the last two or three weeks that uh, United Counties has has come on board. Huh, little play on words. Um, <laughs> with this program in promoting it to all those that we serve as well. So, um, yeah, so it's, that's, that could, that could uh, help the numbers as well and make it more sustainable. Just wanted to share that. But awesome report. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jasmine. I'm glad to hear that. I'm a little surprised they weren't promoting it earlier, though. Well, Surprised and not surprised, uh, but uh, that is something that could save us all some some money because they 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 do help out with uh, vouchers and so on for transportation uh, for people within the county. So this could actually be of real assistance across the board. So that that that's good to hear. It's happening. It's a little disappointing it didn't happen before now, but uh, better later than never. Uh, other comments, questions. 
Gory, did you have anything you wanted to add with regards to, uh, uh, you know, you and you and Steve did a great job there promoting it uh, there a week or two ago and good, good stuff. It's great to see that kind of support from within Edwardsburg Cardinal Council. Yeah, no, you know, we had, we had a good day. We were able to talk to a lot of people on the bus. Uh, as I said, the, the different reasons for people taking the bus. He knows he has a fight on his hands uh, with his council to, to keep this going. But I think the more we do that, the more we get out and experience it and talk to passengers. You know, one lady was, was telling me that, a, a, you know, a cab ride from Brockville to Cardinal or Cardinal to Brockville is $54. So, you know, I'm not taking, I'm not taking any money away from, from the taxi companies, but not everyone can afford $54 each way, you know? So when you hear, when you hear that and you put $5 versus $54 on the board, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more people that, that are going to take it. And, and even people that, you know, we, we think that it's just for people that don't have, um, enough funds let's say or can't afford a car but but you know like if your car is in the shop and you got to go to work you, this is an this is an opportunity for you to use you know um the, the 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 two drivers were very very nice one one did say i did uh she she, she mentioned that um they brought i think five or six golfers from brockville to come play in prescott and she, you know, instead of dropping them off at the grocery store or at the Giant Tiger, she said she was willing to drop them right at the, the golf course as long as it was safe and there was no cars around, you know. So I thought that was that was really uh, good of her to do that. And, and I know the probably the golfers were probably excited to have that even on the way back. They don't have to carry their clubs through town. But little things like that that will make this, this go forward. Um, you know, even uh, and even talking to the, the drivers themselves, they have ideas and, and, you know, they have suggestions, which I thought was fantastic because they're sitting in the seat driving the bus, you know, like this would be a better spot here to stop. And I, and I was like, all for it. I'm like, you tell your boss, your boss will tell our different councils and they'll, they'll work something out. This is only two months in we're going to learn things as we go and we're going to, we're going to make it better. So uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of it uh, and uh, I'd love to see it continue. Thanks again, uh, Councilor Shankar. And uh, thanks of course, again, also to uh, Councilor Dillabaugh. It's great, great to, to see you out there promoting this. And I, it's, it's an exciting project and I, I do think it's got, there's grounds, the possibility to expand this. I know North Grenville's already mentioned an interest as well. And the bigger it gets, actually, the, the more financially sustainable it will be. It'll open up more gas tax support. And just the one thing I would mention when we're, we're looking into this next report in January to make sure that uh, Minister Clark's office is involved as well when we're looking at anything provincials. He's been a big booster of this, this project uh, overall. And uh, uh, be good to have his office's input uh, regarding uh, extra applications and so forth for provincial funding. I think it's definitely available and we can make a good case for, for all of that, but uh, just want to make sure that uh, our, our local players there are, are, are heavily involved. Any further comments from members of council tonight on this? Uh, seeing none, thanks everyone uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, that, uh, that discussion. Thanks staff. We'll look forward to that coming back and uh, roughly a couple of months to uh, to get uh, some input on the next steps. But uh, thanks very much for that. So we'll move on to 12.5, that's staff report uh, 111, 2021. That's uh, the My Main Street Community Activator Funding Program. Uh, recommendation reads here that council direct staff to proceed with applying to the My Main Street Community Activator Program for funding support in the amount of $80,000 for the purpose of completing community enhancements within Prescott's Riverwalk District to support ongoing placemaking, business development, and visitor attraction strategies. Could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Young, seconded by, I think, Councillor Jansman just beat out Councillor Ostrander. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Ms. Valentine uh, for the report tonight. Dana, please uh, take us through uh, uh, the, the uh, particulars here. 
Thank you, Mayor Todd, through you to council. Uh, so we're bringing forward an opportunity for a new funding program. It requires no contribution on the behalf of the municipality. So it's essentially free money aside from, of course, the in-kind and, and the overhead associated with the ongoing project management. It's a pretty exciting project and it's a complement to the My Main Street Accelerator Program application that we brought forth that received approval at the last council meeting which I'd like to thank council for and also update you that the application has gone in and we are uh, waiting uh, with bated breath uh, the outcome of that. So fingers crossed we'll be successful. And we're bringing forth this application for, this is more for physical uh, dollars to actually implement some of the activities that we've targeted for just general um, community downtown revitalization, business attraction and supports, and uh, some of our visitor attraction strategies. So there's a few different projects that we're requesting funding for under this stream. I'll just take you through the list of projects versus going into the background because I did touch on a lot of the um, program background during the previous council report. So essentially what we're applying for is $80,000 in funding to support uh, several projects. The first and foremost would be to design and build a series of pop-up uh, patios uh, that would be placed in two to three key parking spaces within Prescott's uh, Riverwalk downtown core. And it's essentially, these would be public gathering spaces that would also, they would be a patio, they would be equipped with seating and other pedestrian amenities. And they would be available for just the general uh, pedestrians visiting the community to uh, sit down and enjoy the downtown and hopefully keep them in the downtown for a bit longer and extend those stays and of course the economic benefit to our business community, as well as it would provide a bit of a dining space for restaurants within the downtown core that don't have their own patios. These spaces could be used by customers that are purchasing takeout food. They wouldn't necessarily be there for the service, like for table service for the use of restaurants, but definitely available for uh, people to uh, eat, take out, enjoy their takeout food and hopefully keep them again within the downtown. and continuing to spending money in that area and experiencing all the great assets that we have to offer. Uh, secondly, we're looking at uh, hopefully uh, covering the cost. This is a project that you're probably familiar with. We're exploring the uh, new mural sign for the Coast Guard fence that abuts Kelly's Beach in Centennial Park. So we're hoping to offset the cost of installing that signage. It is a very extensive sign. If you're familiar with that fence, it's about 80 feet by six feet high. That's the assigned face that we actually need to cover. So just from the sheer square footage alone, it's going to be a significant expense. So we're hoping to possibly offset that with the Mine Main Street funding. And then we're looking at developing a new incentive program. It would be using a smartphone application to develop basically a visitor experience app that would also work as kind of a digital passport where visitors and residents, so it would be available for everyone, um, would really, it's just an application to try and encourage people to uh, support and experience all the great things that Prescott has to offer. And there would be an incentive program involved in that where uh, you could essentially accumulate points for visiting or experiencing different locations and then uh, exchange those points for Prescott Proud dollars that you could then spend in the community. So we're pretty excited about this application. It's been developed by a few other municipalities in our area and then across Canada and globally. And it's really, uh, it's a great way to expose people to your community in a very accessible format. And we can also have it, um, we're also looking at having it available on a few kiosks throughout the community, just to really uh, kind of introduce it to visitors when they are coming in the community, and then they could carry on using it on their smartphone as they're out exploring the rest of Prescott. And then we're also looking at the uh, funding for some new uh, custom year round lighting for some of the pedestrian, um, light poles, the light standards within the uh, downtown Riverwalk area. So these would be, we're thinking something along the lines of pole mounted uh, lighthouses, uh, possibly cannons, 
something that really, um, you know, signifies, stands for Prescott and brings those uh, kind of unique features that we have as a community, lighthouses and the fort being uh, two of those uh, major assets that I think makes us unique and separates us from other areas. So we thought maybe a lighting project would be a great way to uh, revitalize the downtown and attract uh, more people to the community, both visitors and residents throughout the year. If you look to Gananoque, I believe they, or Brockville actually has year round um, pedestrian level lighting. And I think there's sailboats in Brockville. So something kind of similar to that, but of course uh, unique to Prescott. And then we're also looking at, uh, we've identified a number of enhancements that could be made for the farmers and crafters market. Now that we've got a first season under our belts, everything from some new lighting, uh, possibly some propane fire pits, as well as uh, a misting station for the summer months. Uh, as, um, for those of you who uh, visited the market, I'm sure you can attest to, there were some very hot days down there. So we thought a misting station would be a fun, uh, attraction for people to come down to the market and just a few other enhancements that we're looking at as well. New signage is another uh, critical area that we really need to step up next year too. So we're also, and then lastly, we're looking at acquiring a, what's called a pedestrian counting device. So this would be used across, could be used across multiple departments, not just specific to economic development and tourism. It's basically a counter that can uh, measure and report back on the amount of foot traffic that you're getting, whether it be on a trail, at a specific event site, a downtown sidewalk, the new Prescott Museum and Visitor Center, and it's portable. So it can be used for, you know, in a variety of locations. It's just a tie strap that mounts to a pole or a post, and it can be installed, like I say, in a multitude of locations. It could even be used by operations department for some of their work that they're doing throughout town. So it's uh, hoping to, again, offset the expense of that through this application. And that's basically a summary of the key activities we're hoping to fund. The total cost that we've um, identified for that is $80,000. As I mentioned, there would be no cost to the municipality aside from the in-kind ongoing project management and the applications are due December 1st uh, with the expenses to be incurred throughout 2022. So from January to December, 2022. And we are a, a target community based on the eligibility guidelines. So I think we're in a good position to potentially be successful for this application. As far, as far as alternatives, council could uh, choose to decline the opportunity or identify some alternate activities that you'd like to see us focus on instead. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Just the only quick question I've got before I open it up, did we not apply for the year one funding on this? I, I know a lot of this came back to us, I think originally a little while back. Did we apply for the year one funding and weren't didn't receive it or, because I remember that bit about the kiosks and even the, uh, the comments about the, uh, Oh, the, the signage along the Coast Guard property fencing, because that was actually looking to be installed last summer. Did, did, did we not apply for that before? No, we, had, um, we haven't applied to year one at this point. It was only open for about a month period. We did apply to the accelerator stream, which was for the community ambassador, uh, as well as the market profile development and the business attraction and development grants, which was approved just recently. This mural project, it's, it's been in the works for several months. This was just an opportunity that came along to possibly offset the expense for that. So it is, it's something that's very much been in the works. It's just taken a bit longer than anticipated to get the final design and costing done on that mural. So it just happened to uh, work out well with this funding opportunity. We did apply for the CCRF, which is another funding that fund that we're expecting to hear word on uh, sometime in December. There was a little bit of overlap with that area. We were looking at applying for a park hat specific to the farmer's market uh, clock tower square, as well as some lighthouse upgrades. So it could be that uh, fund that you're thinking of, Mayor Todd. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. I just know that we, we did budget for that attraction signage on the Coast Guard property. And it's all great if we can get funding for it, though. I just, just wondered about that one. And then that bit about the... Uh, 
uh, the pop-up parkettes, because that was a report that came back to council quite a number of months ago now. So anyways, good to see us uh, moving forward on, on an application here. Uh, thanks very much for the report. I'll open it up for uh, comments, questions from members of council. Just quickly, Mayor Todd, I will jump in and say the parkettes was part of that CCRF application as, uh, okay. as well. Yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. Yeah, just good to get clarity on that because that's a that that got a lot of good positive attention from the BIA in particular. So good to see we're still looking at, uh, at potentially doing that for 2022. Yeah, uh, I think we applied for five to six of those pop ups. So hopefully we'll receive word soon. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, so open it up for comments, questions. Uh, Councilor Shankar, please. Uh, thank you. Dana, I, I like this proposal. Uh, I love some of the ideas. There's some, you know, new technology ideas that you're using with a smartphone app that, that you know, the younger generation will, will love that. I really like the, the year-round pedestrian lighting. I know we've talked about getting lighting down at Riverwalk Park. I know we're still, I think we're still waiting for the fort to let us know uh, if we can do that. So, I, I'm, I'm hoping we do get this funding because a lot of these are really good ideas. And, you know, the, even a misting station at first, I was like, what? But I realized July can be hot. <laughs> Not like today, where a fire pit would have been really nice. If you want to put a fire pit uh, on Main Street, that'd be great. But um, yeah, no, I think it's good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Shankar. Other comments, questions? Uh, seeing none, I will uh, return to the motion then and uh, call the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dana. And 12.6 is uh, staff report uh, 112, uh, 2021 uh, Marina Dock Repairs and Replacements uh, recommendation. Here is a council direct staff to issue a request for proposals for the replacement of the Marina G dock and H dock. Could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor Ostrander. Uh, Nathan, I believe this is uh, yours. So if you'd like to just take us uh, through some of the particulars, I guess we did get an update on this. Uh, it was at the last meeting. We knew this was uh, uh, coming our way. So please uh, give us the particulars. Excellent. Thank you through, through Mayor Todd. Um, so this report kind of runs through uh, a little bit of information on where we're at with the marina on the uh, the major infrastructure components there, which being the docks. Um, so it was constructed in 1985, so it was 36 years ago. Um, and really no major work has been conducted on the docks or the, uh, the fingers uh, coming off the docks in, in that period of time. Um, a typical lifespan of these steel tube floating docks with the 3 16 uh, wall thickness is with a wood covering is about 25 to 30 years. So it gives you a sense of kind of where we're going with the report. Um, in uh, 2020, each dock was removed because it did take on water um, from uh, some you know, uh, sequence of holes that, that just allowed the water to come into the, uh, the tubes. Um, and some of the sections have been, uh, have been filled with closed cell foam. So what happens in the uh, spring and the fall is the uh, operation staff will kind of look and see which, which of the tubes are starting to sink. And then uh, we'll have a, the guys will cut holes in the top of them and then we'll have a contractor fill them with closed cell foam, which gives us a little bit more time with those particular docks and tubes. Um, so the marina has a total of nine main docks uh, ranging in length from 55 feet to 190 feet. And a total of 70 uh, kind of fingers coming off of those gives you about 130 boat slips. Um, so we did have um, a uh, Kehoe Marine Construction uh, look at the all the docks this fall. Um, they're a, a very reputable uh, dock um, inspection company and fabricator uh, in the area, and uh, they did observe again most of the steel is steel tubing is pitting uh, kind of where the water table hits it. And um, they did find, you know, other, you know, so those are having those produce varying leaks or leaks of varying degrees. Um, lots of the docks need some of the chains tightened and the, the bolts and the washers and shims need to be reviewed as well. Um, and then they did look at some of the uh, concrete anchors and thought maybe some of those could be adjusted as well to, uh, to kind of minimize the dock movement and then maximize the dock stability. So just kind of make sure they're, you know, out to the, to the right position they need to be in to, 
um, to give us the proper flexibility on the different uh, kind of fluctuations and water tables that we do get on the river. Um, so we will have them probably come back in the spring of 2022 and do some of that uh, typical maintenance on the majority of the docks. Um, and based on their observations, of course, H dock needs to be replaced. And then they said G dock would be the next one that we should put on the agenda to get replaced uh, in the spring. And um, again, they, they did reiterate that, you know, we're kind of past due on, on all those docks. So we should, uh, should look at uh, a plan to be replacing them in the, in the future. Um, so H dock doesn't have water or electrical and then G doc does have, um, it does have water and electrical services on it. Uh, so we would put out a request for proposal for those two docks and um, it would be a design build uh, supply request. And so however they get them to our, to the docks or to the marina, whether they float them down or ship them down um, on a truck and then uh, crane them in, that would be uh, whatever suits them, I guess would be uh, the proposed method. And um, we will ask them as well to provide some options for different materials as council has requested in the past for uh, maybe different materials for the tubing and different materials on the decking. Um, that may give long, uh, you know, may cost more uh, upfront, but give uh, longer longevity to, uh, to the materials. Um, so the, uh, the intention going forward to replace uh, one dock or two smaller docks uh, each year starting in 2023 and so that all the docks are replaced by 2027 so that uh, you know, we don't, uh, we're not fighting sinking docks um, in the future. Um, so other than that, council could you know, proceed to, uh, to not proceed with the request for proposal or change it as they see fit. And then uh, on the finance side of it, there's currently uh, the Marina Reserve has $140,000 and $300, and the annual contribution to the reserve is uh, $79,435, which will, uh, is expected to be maintained going into 2022. And um, it's estimated that that amount should be sufficient to, to cover the docks off in the spring for 2022. And, that's the, uh, and then also attached was our uh, layout to the Marina as well. Um, we did have a subsequent discussion with Kehoe and they did have some ideas to continue to, continue to uh, um, look at different options for maybe expanding the Marine as well, which we'll continue to, to have discussions with them on that and council. Thank you, that's everything for the report. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Nathan. I'll open it up to council for comments and start with Councilor Young, please. Thank you, Brett. Um, Nathan, I'm very pleased to hear that um, they might look at, or they will look at rejigging the marina. I, I think there are some opportunities to gain some slips or at least um, provide an opportunity to rent to some larger boats. I understand that um, most of the, in the past, the waiting list has always been larger boats that we could not accommodate. And it would be wonderful to get those into the marina somehow by Rejigging um, some of the some of the fingers, and uh, especially um, Dock H, which um, is solely or basically small smaller boats. Um, it could maybe it could be extended when they look at it um, to make room for another slip or two. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ray. Uh, other comments, questions? Uh, seeing no other comments, questions, then I uh, will return to the motion and call the question. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. And we are now on to 12.7. That's staff report uh, 113, 2021. COVID shop local support programs. Recommendation here reads that council approve the COVID shop local support programs with an allocation of up to a maximum of $23,435 to support participating businesses in Prescott funded by the COVID funding received by the province of Ontario, received from the province of Ontario. Uh, could I have a mover please? Councilor Burton, thank you very much. And lots of seconders, but I think Councilor McConnell had his hand up first. Uh, so I will turn it over to uh, Dana again. Ms. Valentine, please, if you could uh, take us through uh, the particulars of your report. Thank you, Mayor Todd, through you to Council. 
We had uh, some really great success with the first round of this program as a uh, way to uh, expense some of the generous uh, COVID support funding that we received. We developed some business support programs that involved the allocation of our Prescott Proud dollars. And we're bringing a very similar recommendation uh, before you for the 2021 mm -hmm. holiday season. So we'd like to essentially equip businesses with uh, direct handout of dollars again this year, as well as utilize these dollars for some prizes as part of some new programs that we're developing. So the first of which uh, would be a new uh, shop local passport program that we're developing uh, specific for the holiday season. It's going to run from December 1st to the 29th where members of the community will collect a, a passport and get that passport stamped by a participating business for every time they make a purchase for a minimum of $5. And once they get all their um, five stamps on their passport, they can submit that passport to enter into weekly and grand prize dry, draws, grand prize draws, and what we're hoping to do is allocate $6,000 uh, for the use of those prizes between the weekly and grand prize. So the weekly would be a $50 uh, prize. And then for grand prizes, we're hoping to award 1,500, 1,000 and 500. And they would be drawn at the end of December and they could be utilized uh, for capturing some of those boxing week deals or for some last minute uh, holiday shopping that people have to do. And then of course the weekly draws will inject some uh, dollars into people's hands throughout the month of December to hopefully get them out um, supporting some of our local businesses during their holiday shopping. And the second part of that would be the direct business distribution to customers. So we're proposing $10,000 be allocated for this, whereby businesses would receive a select amount. We generally um, disperse about $100 per business. Uh, some of the larger businesses, uh, we might uh, increase a little bit just because of the level of customers and traffic that they receive. But all in all, every participating business would receive dollars that could either be handed out to customers as a thank you for purchase or could actually be used to apply a direct discount at the time of purchase. And this is a new enhancement that we're proposing this year. It used to be simply you were would hand them out to a customer after they make a purchase and then they could be spent later on down the road. But just based on what we're seeing and the use of these dollars in the community, we think this option would be a great way to really help support some of the smaller independent businesses that don't necessarily get the lion's share of these dollars being respent down the road. So we thought this would be a great option to uh, just really increase and kind of widen the support that all businesses are getting. And then we would also be proposing a similar discounted uh, dollar sale as we did last year. So throughout the month of December, we sold Prescott Proud dollars directly to the public uh, from Town Hall for a discounted rate of 25%. So essentially you could buy $100 for 75. And it was a really, the response that we received to this program was overwhelming. A lot of community support. People were very excited about these either buying them to give as Christmas gifts or just to use them at discounted dollars to go out and support a local business for a reduced price. So we're very excited about the programs that we've brought forth uh, tonight. I think they were all very well received. And then just one small addition this year with our holiday farmers and crafters market taking place at the Leo Boyvin on December 4th. We're like, uh, we'd like to use 500 of those dollars for some door prizes that again, will be encouraging people to uh, take the opportunity to shop in our local businesses while they're at the craft show. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, encourage uh, some of that uh, shopping uh, in the downtown area as part of the event. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, as I mentioned, it was very, all aspects were very well received. So we thought we would propose a very similar mix to the programming that we brought forth back in the summer and as part of last year's uh, holiday promotions. Uh, total cost between the four different programs is 23,435. And then of course, council could elect to change the parameters or decide not to proceed with it at this time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dana. I'll open it up to uh, council for uh, comments and questions. Councilor McConnell, please. 
Thank you, Mayor Todd. I would say anything we could do to help our businesses at this particular time of year. I know having been in business, winter is not the greatest time to, uh, to look forward to, but we do have Christmas coming up. And if we can give uh, our merchants some help and provide some good buys, uh, that is a, a 25 discount percent discount to our citizens as well. I think it's worthwhile us going down that road. So I would be in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, other comments, questions on this report? Uh, seeing none, I just wanted to, oh, Councilor Shankar, please. Uh, I just wanted to say it's, it's, a, it's a good program. Um, I think it's well utilized. Like uh, we we've seen some Prescott dollars come in; they just go out as quick as they come in. Uh, I know that I bought some dollars when it was last year, and during COVID, went to the you know like the, the businesses that were hurting, the hairdressers and the restaurants, and tried to support them with Prescott dollars, and it's just like cash to them. So they're all they're usually pretty recipient towards them you know uh so i think it's a good program doesn't cost us a lot of money it creates a lot of goodwill amongst the small businesses um i say we just keep doing it so i'm in favor of it thank you thanks very much uh gory any other comments uh seeing none i just did want to thank uh staff for this it's as difficult as COVID has been, uh, we've done as much or more than any other municipality in the region, if not the province, uh, with regards to, to helping out, promoting shop local, working with our businesses to help them transition uh, over to a more of a digital embraced uh, uh, economy for their business. And just thanks a lot from all of us, uh, Dana, to uh, your, your whole department. Uh, it's been something we can be very proud of as a municipality uh, and then going forward and continuing with this, we've established some programs that are going to endure beyond COVID uh, in partnership with the BIA and, and uh, all our businesses in the downtown and uptown. So great to see this. Uh, so with that, I will uh, uh, finish off by uh, calling for the vote of the motion. Uh, all in favor. Thanks everyone. Motion is passed. And we now are at 12.8, that's staff report 114-2021. Uh, that's a report on uh, the second floor renovations here in the town hall. We do have an update from Mr. Armstrong tonight. This is just being uh, put out for information, but uh, I'll turn it over to Matt uh, for a review of uh, what's happening with the second floor renovations. Mr. Armstrong, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So back in 2019, council approved um, the further renovations of the second floor, including a boardroom, uh, office control room, multi-use physical activity room, uh, washrooms, a kitchenette and auditorium. So uh, it's been a number of delays due to staffing changes and other projects uh, emerging that uh, is required a reallocation of resources. But, but certainly um, as we uh, move into 2022 and uh, with our renewed focus on uh, providing community services and uh, opportunities for people to use facilities, then it wanted to, to bring this back to council and, and uh, show exactly where we are. So approximately 6% of the work is completed on the boardroom, office control room, multi-use uh, activity room, and the main hallway. Um, really what is uh, left is ceiling floors and uh, just mechanical work to be completed. Uh, while we were reviewing the critical path, so internally we sat down and said, how do we uh, get this project to completion? And we uh, realized we, we need a full sector of, sec well, a set of architectural drawings along with the requisite mechanical and electrical uh, designs. And so uh, that uh, is something that uh, we're in the process of uh, obtaining and, uh, and having that uh, final documentation available and on file. And so it can address any life safety issues, uh, as well as uh, making sure that the uh, egress and um, fire safety is uh, all addressed as well. So we uh, we are working with uh, Deming uh, Architecture and as well as JRP Engineering to to get that work done. And one of the things that uh, we has changed a little bit since 2019 is we were planning on two general neutral or non-gender specific washrooms. However, the requirement for universal bathrooms and uh, the size uh, in relation to them 
is much bigger than uh, what uh, was there previously. And so we're planning on just putting uh, the one universal bathroom in as opposed to uh, the two separate ones. Um, we, uh, I think in, over the last couple of meetings have mentioned about uh, council and the ability to, uh, to hold meetings and, uh, you know, as more space is required, that sort of thing. So I uh, want to give a reassurance that um, any of the rooms could be used uh, for council uh, depending on the size of the audience or if there's a special event and, uh, and we want uh, uh, more people involved in, the, in a particular council meeting. Uh, there has been a, quite a bit of interest uh, from different user groups uh, for the, the facilities such as the second floor. Uh, Walker House obviously is a, a number of their programs uh, would benefit from the multi-use and uh, as well as we're uh, looking at reintroducing an after-school program. So uh, we're uh, kind of in uh, discussions with a couple of groups uh, that uh, are interested in doing that. So I'm very excited that uh, that will be uh, a possibility as well as low impact um, uh, fitness classes such as yoga. Uh, we've also had a number of inquiries around uh, training space. People are looking for anywhere from 15 to 50 participants. And uh, that would certainly be supported by uh, any of two of the larger rooms in particular. And really the goal of the, the second floor usage is to get to 20 to 30 hours per week with a mixture of daytime, evening and weekend uh, users. And so certainly uh, based on what we're seeing so far and, and people being interested that uh, that's certainly the, the goal that we want to obtain. And, uh, but we did want to provide a, an update as to where we are, uh, how we're moving forward, and, uh, and then hopefully uh, having this uh, project completed in 2022 with the funds that are already allocated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, I will open it up now for comments, questions from members of council. Uh, Councilor Young, please. Hi, will we have a chance to look at the drawings before we start um, construction? Uh, certainly, I, I think we can, uh, the the last part of the drawings will be kind of the kitchenette, the washroom and the, the large auditorium in the back, but certainly we can make them available um, to council before we uh, move forward on those uh, particular items. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. Other comments, questions? Councillor Jansman, uh, then Ostrander and McConnell, please. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Uh, Matthew, am I understanding correctly that the one the change to the washrooms, would that now only mean one washroom for the second floor? That's correct. Um, however, it would be fully uh, accessible and uh, being available. Uh, we still have the washrooms on the first floor that are certainly available, but yes, it would be one washroom for the second floor due to the size that uh, universal washrooms take up now. I'm just, uh, good point about the washrooms uh, downstairs, which are, are all good, but um, I suppose it's been re like one washroom for, for instance, if, if Walker House does use the, the facilities, that might be a lot of people for one washroom. You know what I mean? Okay. We'll certainly take that under advisement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Jansman. Councillor Ostrander. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, Matt, I just, uh, Curious, we've had several smaller conversations about a, a, a designated uh, council chambers on the second floor and that there was some talk about social distancing wasn't gonna be possible. And there was some, uh, I don't know, wiring for sound or something else was, uh, was mentioned another time. I just wondered, are we not going to have a designated uh, council chambers? And you mentioned about we could move around to Two or three different rooms, if uh, depending on the event. I just wondered, is that is that the direction we're going in now with uh, the council chamber thing? I think my intention would be to council chambers could remain where it is, but depending on whether the the need for the size of a greater number of people, um, I think would be uh, uh, served by being able to move uh, to any one room or to any other room. So. Uh, really want to make sure that we still have a dedicated council space, but at the same time, uh, provide the flexibility if we do have larger audiences um, that we can move that. One thing that I will likely uh, come back to council to be able to uh, make that happen is uh, slightly different furniture than what we have now. It, uh, that table is large, bulky, and uh, difficult to, um, to maneuver uh, in rooms and around them. So 
Uh, it's something I'm still uh, investigating and researching. And uh, when and if I find a solution, then I will be back to council to have that discussion so that then it makes that ability to use any other room uh, much easier. Okay, thanks. Just uh, curious as to where, where that was headed, but that's, that's good, thank you. Just as a reminder on that, like Matt and I did talk about that a few times in recent weeks, and this actually came up when we first we first looked at this. I quite sure, anyways, uh, it did come up with uh, the North Grenville example because they use the uh, the modular desks they wheel out for the council meetings in the amphitheater there uh, in the theater room, and then then wheel them back in. Uh, so we what we talked about possibly doing something like that that we could utilize uh, the larger room as needed with uh, you know, for for larger events and. Uh, you know, citizens awards and if you, you happen to have a, uh, a significant meeting so you we'd, we'd have options upstairs is what i'm saying basically uh councilor mcconnell please thank you mayor todd um i took advantage of the opportunity to take a tour into the town hall this afternoon and i took a a very good look at the second hall or second hall the second floor the part that is unfinished um, I took some measurements of our current council chambers and uh, the areas in the unfinished part. Uh, there is another room uh, that will be in the new part of the second floor that is exactly the same size as our existing council chambers. Uh, there's another room uh, that's going to be designated as a boardroom, which will be a bit smaller and have that large boardroom table, uh, that uh, nice wood one that we've had around for a while. But what really impressed me was when I stepped through into what uh, has been described as the auditorium area. And that encompasses the area of our previous council chambers um, and uh, another area the same size as that. So it's double the size of our existing council chambers. It's got windows all the way around. It's big, it's bright and uh, if we are going to move somewhere and have a permanent home for council, uh, to me, that's the place to have it. Uh, you're not going to have to be looking over your shoulder when staff is talking or just listening, facing the other di direction, which is not very courteous to staff. Um, in addition, with the size of that room, um, if we go to individual furniture per councillor, as Matthew has, has alluded to, uh, there's lots of space where that could be uh, put out of the way and, and that room used for other things. So um, Matthew and I had a, a bit of a talk about it this afternoon while, while I was looking through. And I think quite frankly, that is the way to go for council. I don't believe having a dedicated council room uh, like we have now is a very good use of space. <clears throat> I was in our old council, our existing council chambers today for the first time in, I guess, over a year. And once again, I was struck how small it is. And uh, with the plexiglass uh, divisions that were put in, that uh, it just makes it even more crowded. So if the furniture were to come out of that room, um, if we weren't using it, that could be used immediately for other purposes. So I, I am in favor of going ahead and finishing the, uh, the, the new area on the second floor. I would be in favor of us uh, utilizing that auditorium space for council on a permanent basis and for having furniture that is movable so that uh, uh, area could be used for other activities. Thank you. Oh, uh, one thing that the auditorium area, um, I was under the impression the whole thing had just been all torn out, but uh, there is virtually very, very, very little work to do on the three outside walls in that auditorium. Essentially it's the floor, and putting a ceiling in, and then your mechanical aspects, the heating and air conditioning and lighting. So um, that large area is not gonna take an awful lot to, uh, to, uh, to complete it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McConnell. And I, I think we're all like, I, we don't have to absolutely designate a specific space because if we go to the, the furniture is gonna be the key item because if we go that, that furniture route and we can definitely do it, you, you may have to have something custom made uh, that uh, I think it, it, it really does help all the way around to have something that's more movable, whether you know, you've got one room designated or not uh, for, uh, for council chambers. Uh, you've just got to have the right furniture to be able to move back and forth you know, if there is something that requires the use of the smaller room or the larger room. But I, I, you know, I'd agree in that, that back room. I just want to make sure that if we do go down those line, the, that road and make it more the, the permanent where the regular meetings are, I'm definitely not against it. The issue with that would be uh, we, we've got to be able to repurpose it quickly as well to get the desks and tables out of there if we have an event or you know so on, because we've got space back there that could seat well over 100. Uh, and uh, you know, most of the time, that's not going to be necessary for, for a council meeting. So if we did have other events, I think there's we got to have a little bit of flexibility for this if we're going to get the most use out of the area. But that's going to be the question, on, as, as Mr. Armstrong mentioned, is the question is it's not going to be cheap, that furniture. We can pretty much guarantee that all that all that stuff comes at a real cost. But if we get the right stuff, we could have it for many decades as well. So I think there's some some real positives to this. And I think overall, the, the second floor looks looks reasonably good and it's got a lot of flexibility there. And I think we just got to make sure have, uh, how, how we do the furnishings and set up the AV stuff as well. Uh, just to make sure that we have that flexibility in terms of meeting space, because I think we're, we're COVID or not, uh, we're at we're at the era when uh, we have to be able to uh, allow everyone to have hybrid meetings, so people can call in and be in the room in person. So I think that is uh, that's that's something that's definitely with us uh, for good. So we just have to make sure that we have the monitors to do that, so we can move the furnishings back and forth. But I, I don't think we need to decide in the absolute direction, like in dedicating a room tonight, unless somebody really wanted to go there, because I think we just need to get to, to know a little bit more about what's what's being planned and get caught up with the furnishings. The one thing I would say too, is only one washroom upstairs. That could be challenging for the reasons that Teresa mentioned. So if we do have big events, say you've got a, you know, a Christmas play and, you know, I'll be, I, Shakespeare did approach us with the, the possibility of some sort of play there this year. And of course we weren't ready for it. So there's real possibility where we could promote events in there that would seat 100 to 150 people and only one washroom on the floor uh, could be really challenging, especially if you've got seniors that you know, need the use of the washrooms during the intermissions, uh, you know, elevator, you, you, you know, there could be issues there. So I think we may have to take some of that space for the second washroom. And I, I would encourage staff to really look at that because just for capacity issues uh, with regards to, uh, I don't think we should be, making people travel through the floors uh, from one floor to the next to use the washroom. But that's the one real concern I have. I think otherwise I'm disappointed it's taken this long, but there've been some issues and we have to, we have to address it. Matthew, you did tell me personally, you were talking about early next year, not just 2022. Can we, uh, can we stick to that or because we've been waiting a long time on this overall project? Certainly. So I think uh, the front part, uh, which includes the, the hallway, the boardroom, and the uh, multi-use physical activity, is we would be looking for uh, late winter, early spring. And then uh, for the final back room, washroom and kitchenette, uh, looking for mid-year next year. Okay. So however we could expedite that, I think it's, I mean, the second floor just isn't that usable right now with no washrooms, no facilities just and, and we've been you know like this is four years of this now so the earlier we can get to this and get this 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 wrapped up the better especially with regards to the kitchenette and the washrooms so uh, if you could maybe give us a little more detailed uh, update on what we're looking at for the work once we finalize the design thank you any other comments uh, tonight? I think uh, everybody's feedback, and if anyone has any other feedback on this, we want to make this this floor as usable as possible for ourselves and the community at large. Lee, another comment? Uh, just something that uh, you said, uh, Brad, uh, indicating that it, the, if we took the large area for um, the council chambers or used it for council chambers, that uh, the furniture should be uh, movable in case it needs to be used for something else. I think that's Rob really the complete opposite way it should be looking at it because that area, whatever we use, is only used for three hours 
uh, a month in the summer, uh, each month, and in the winter, spring, and fall months, it's only used two or three days a, uh, um, a month, and again, for about three hours. So I think the way we should be looking at it is being able to put the desks into that area. In other words, take that area and transform it into the council chambers, not looking at it as the council chambers that we're gonna take the desks out of. It's, it's going to be an area that is going to be very, very usable for many, many things, and that we can quickly change into a council chambers for the few hours, um, a month or a week that uh, we're gonna use it. So I think, that, I think that's the way we should look at it. It's, it's a more usable way to look at it. Yeah, I, I think we're really on the same page with this. It sounds like we all pretty much are. The only caution I'll, I'll put out there is if we've, I don't want to go back to the days of a transitory council chambers. It doesn't look good. It's not what we're, we're trying to present as a municipality. We went through a lot of years where we had those ridiculous school desks that we're all slamming our knees into constantly. They had drawers, which was a, a, a positive over the current ones, but we, we've got to be able to present. One thing I would say about the current room is it, it, despite the fact it's a little small, although we can still get probably 30 to 40 people in there without, without COVID restrictions, of course. Uh, but we've just got to make sure that we, we present what we're trying to present there because we, we took some real nice strides with the renovation of the building initially with the council chambers, the way it was renovated back then. And I think we've set up a pretty nice looking room now that I, I think does the job. So I, th I think we've just got to look at, look at it from both ways, but I, I think we're in full agreement on it. We've just got to see what the options are for the furnishings and, uh, you know, what a company might come back with and what they'd recommend, because it, it, you know, I agree with you totally. It's got to be usable, but I, I think we've got to have some sense of maybe it's not permanency is not the right words, but just that proper presentation so we can have good, good professional meetings that reflect what we're trying to, to get out there as a municipality. Because that does that 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 is important in the end when you're trying to to pitch to developers and uh, just just Definitely. sets a good standard. So, but I think yeah, I know I think we're on the right page with the same page with all of this. Uh, anyone else have any any other comments? We'll just have to wait till till Matt comes back with a little more detail on the design uh, with some of the comments mentioned tonight that were raised by uh, by members of council here. But we'll have something back in the any idea of a time frame, Matthew, when you could maybe bring something back to us before the end of the year. Uh, we'll do our best uh, to get it to you by the end of the year, if not the first meeting in January. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are getting awful close now to the end of the year. So we only got a couple meetings left after uh, after this one. So thanks very much. Uh, any uh, any final comments before I move on? Uh, seeing none, uh, thanks again for the update, uh, Matt. And thanks for the good discussion. Everyone will bring that back and take a, a, real, uh, a real good look at the final ideas for the design uh, for the end of the year, very early in the new year. Uh, so we do have now, and uh, boy, we've kept her waiting a long time here. We probably should have moved this one up. I didn't even uh, didn't even didn't even see that it was just saw that it was down. But boy, you're right near the end. But Tracy, thanks for for sticking around with us. So this is 12.9 Staff Report 115 2021, the Annual Emergency Management Review Report. Uh, this is just brought forward for information. But Tracy, if you just want to just review, uh, you stuck around long enough. You better <laughs> go over a few things. And uh, thanks again for putting together that uh, that exercise and. Apologize again. I couldn't. I couldn't make it that day because I had another prior commitment. But I understand it went well. And Tracy, over to you. Thanks, Mayor Todd. Um, yeah, I guess I submitted my uh, annual report on the wrong night. I didn't realize you had uh, quite so many uh, staff reports tonight. But uh, I've got to listen to many uh, interesting conversations tonight. And uh, uh, so the, the report I have uh, submitted uh, for council review is just an overview of. Um, our annual, um, we look at the various components of our emergency uh, program. So one of the responsibilities of our emergency uh, management program committee, which we're a fairly small group and part of our compliance um, through the OFM EM is an annual review, some components, uh, which I've outlined in the report. I won't go into great, great detail on each of the components, but open to questions at the end. Um, so in the report, uh, I talk about the emergency response plan, which uh, is a living document for the town, though there were no changes this year in the main body of the report. 
there is always updating of administrative items and some of the appendices, um, especially since we've gone through COVID, uh, part of 2020 and 2021. So there's always little updates like that. Um, I have um, the main body didn't change. So uh, the main part remains as is. Uh, we've reviewed the hazard and risk assessments of the town. So we look at uh, the various um, uh, hazards we can encounter in the town. They're discussed, they're ranked. Uh, the top three we have within the town of Prescott, uh, number one, a rail emergency, uh, number two, a road emergency, and number three, a pandemic. Uh, these were in place um, before <laughs> pandemic had hit and also uh, before uh, our derailment this year. So it, uh, it was enlightening to review this this year and see that we had that in place. And this is based on past history and um, uh, where we're located, things that can happen. So there's a breakdown of things that we go through when we, uh, we review this. Um, we also looked at the critical infrastructure. We update that uh, based on anything that uh, may have changed in the uh, previous year. We look at the training uh, for the control group, uh, some of the difficulties since 2020 with um, COVID is uh, attending training, bringing in instructors. One of the nice things that has changed uh, with uh, through the OFMEM is they're now looking at uh, virtual training, which everybody is doing based on the pandemic we've gone through. So that will make it easier for the control group to be able to update uh, some training, participate in some training we've talked about for a few years. It's tough to send staff away for these two-day training programs. So the opportunity to participate virtually now uh, will make that much easier for the group. Um, we, we look at the annual, excuse me, annual emergency exercise. Um, in the past, uh, if a township uh, municipality went through an emergency uh, like the pandemic or a train derailment, like an actual emergency, you could apply for an exemption. Uh, they've taken this away. So uh, we found out pretty late this year that um, we were not getting an exemption uh, this year for an annual exercise. We were granted last year, um, as were all other municipalities within Ontario, uh, to be exempt uh, due to the ongoing pandemic. Uh, this year, we did have to complete the annual exercise, which we did on October 14th, um, and we did a train derailment. Uh, so we, we walked through that. Uh, the various components of it, uh, allowing each of the, the members of the group uh, to take the time to go through what the different this the scenario and what their actions would be. So it was a nice, slow, controlled uh, morning where we went through that. And it was good to hear what each of the different agencies, we had OPP in attendance as well, um, what their part uh, and role during an emergency like this is. Uh, so it was a good, good learning. A lot of um, different um, learnings uh, were put forth and some improvements. And this is why we do all these reviews and participate in these emergency exercises is to see where we can improve our emergency plan and what we need to include and gives everybody an opportunity to put their roles, uh, responsibilities into action in a controlled environment where we can see where we can um, improve the plan. Uh, public education is another uh, component of the plan. So that's kind of an ongoing through the year, you know, social media is a big thing right now. So we try to use the website, Facebook, all the social media accounts that we have associated with the town to get uh, emergency preparedness and different um, public, public education out to um, the residents of Prescott. Um, so there were the, the different um, components we looked at and briefly in the report. Uh, to council. Um, I commend the uh, control group this year and last year um, with the pandemic, which was a slow moving emergency for us to participate in. And then the train derailment, which was a quick emergency that we quickly got into place. Um, it was great that the virtual aspect is there now that we can quickly gather uh, virtually um, meet when we need to. Uh, train derailment was completely virtually. It worked very well. Uh, 
I was the liaison here at the fire station for the chief. Um, he's reporting back to myself and Matthew. So it worked very well. Uh, everyone worked wonderfully. And again, it, it was nice to uh, put those um, roles and practices into place to be able to utilize it. Um, again, 2020 and 2021 have turned out to be completely different. It's my first time for me since 2016, I think I've been the CMC uh, to go through an emergency of these magnitudes. So uh, I do commend our, um, everyone in the control group who have participated with um, these different emergencies. That's all I've got. Thanks so much, Tracy. And uh, ext I'd like to extend my thanks as well to yourself, Matthew, and everybody else with the, uh, the control group. It's been a uh, challenging last uh, last couple of years. It's hard to believe we're approaching the, the second anniversary of COVID in the not too distant future, but we have, uh, I did, I did uh, remove the, the, the emergency status there a couple of weeks ago. I, uh, fingers crossed we are through the worst of it, but we do have this winter coming up where things are clearly going to uh, get a little worse before they get better, I would believe, as uh, we can all safely assume that right now. But with any luck, we are through the worst of it, and I think we really have emerged from it with flying colors and it's all thanks to the dedication of everyone on the control group town staff and all our first responders the fire department and, uh, and and the opp as well everybody's come together and the health unit's been uh, was superb with us as well providing timely updates working with us uh, the vaccination clinics that we were able to secure there uh, they went extremely well here in town and you know, we're emerging from this, I think, a stronger community, uh, although I, it's, it's, it's just horrible that we had to go through this to, to get to the finish line, and hopefully at some point we will actually get to the finish line. So thanks very much for the update, Tracy. Sorry to, to keep you waiting around. I should have just moved you up uh, on the agenda, and I didn't even, didn't, didn't even think of it. We we're actually moving through things pretty quickly there. So uh, I will open it up for comments, questions for members of council, and I see Councillor Young uh, has his hand raised. Uh, Ray. Thank you. Uh, well done, Tracy. Good job. I only had one question. Have you got that new fella trained yet? <laughs> well, thankfully, uh, he comes with lots of knowledge uh, uh, and experience. So uh, he has helped uh, immensely as well. I, I said, I'm always uh, learning as I go, despite, I mean, you, I've been in the role since 2016, but there's always something new coming at you. And with groups that change on us and turnover, I mean, we're all um, learning. And uh, yeah, yeah, Chief uh, Rayner has been a, a great help uh, to the emergency management program. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ray. Other uh, comments, questions tonight for Tracy? Seeing none, so I will uh, again, uh, thank thanks uh, Tracy so much for uh, providing the update tonight and for all your work as our CEMC and hopefully things uh, calm down. The next two years are gonna be a little calmer than the last two, so. But thanks again for uh, for the emergency management review and for uh, uh, helping with the, uh, the, the coordination of the exercise and everything you do. So thanks again for joining us tonight and uh, Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. Uh, so with that, we're on a 12.10, that's staff report 116, 2021. Uh, that's the second intake of the 2021 community grants. We do have a recommendation for action here tonight. The recommendation is that council will approve the following 2021 community grants. South Grenville Minor Hockey, $2,400. Prescott Figure Skating Club, $3,400. Connect Youth, $4,000 and Grenville County Historical Society, $500. Uh, could I ask for a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Ostrander, seconded by Councilor McConnell. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, was that yours? Yes, it was. Any comments on, uh, on the numbers and uh, how things have gone with community grant applications so far? Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So uh, the first two uh, grants, the South Carolina Minor Hockey and Prescott Figure Skating Club were uh, submitted as part of the first intake. However, we decided uh, when we were doing the allocations for that first intake that we review them after uh, and with the second intake in the fall. So that's what we're doing now and, and why those two are on the list. Uh, I can say that uh, both are uh, back in activity uh, this fall 
And uh, from what I understand, the Prescott Figure Skating Club has uh, a fantastic uh, number of members this year and uh, is really flourishing. So we're really happy to uh, to hear that and we'll be welcoming them back in uh, in 2023 in their home. So that's uh, fantastic news. Uh, Connect Youth didn't submit um, their normal application, uh, nor did Grenville Historical Society. Uh, as part of Intake 1, they did in Intake 2, and the two amounts, the 4,000 and the 500, uh, are um, consistent with what they've asked for in previous years. Uh, there was two uh, applications, uh, both of which I'm suggesting they come to the December 1st uh, meeting of council uh, to present. The first is the rural fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder. They've asked for $1,000. And uh, of the 150 families they provide support to, approximately 20 are in Prescott. So I uh, thought it was, uh, since it's a new application that, uh, and not from one that uh, we're uh, significantly familiar with locally, I uh, thought it would be a good idea for them to, uh, to come to council and explain exactly what that's all about. Uh, the second one is from, it's a second uh, application from the Food for All Food Bank in the amount of $7,000, 4,000 was part of the first intake and uh, paid and approved, um, but this is a subsequent one for 7,000. So uh, there again, uh, I did reach out to the food bank. They're intending on spending it between now and uh, December 31st. And given the, the size of it, I thought it would be uh, prudent to have them also come to council. Uh, council Ostrander uh, provided his feedback on the, the applications as uh, uh, Councilor McConnell and I sat down and, and had a good conversation about them as well. And so uh, that's how we develop the recommendations. Um, that being said, uh, if the ones that are approved tonight, uh, the four that were listed, uh, that's a total of an additional $10,300 in addition to the 42,100 that's already been paid. And that leaves $5,600 unallocated um, and to address any of the, the further two applications that have been received. And uh, our intention is to um, put out the first intake for the 2022 uh, community uh, grant program uh, this week uh, to be due back uh, just before Christmas. And then we would bring that uh, as part of the budgeting and uh, discussion for council uh, in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, I'll open it up for uh, comments. And okay, so the two members of uh, that uh, working group is Councilor McConnell, Councilor Ostrander. Uh, I'm correct on that. I just uh, invite yep. both of them to speak first to, to lead us into the discussion on the issue. Uh, Mike, did you want to take us uh, start us off? Sure. Uh, I think things uh, fell into place. I, I know uh, minor hockey's always uh, putting their uh, two cents worth in, and I think it was uh, addressed in the first intake. Um, Connect Youth is, uh, as I've mentioned a few times in the past, is involved in a merger with uh, John Howard. John Howard. <laughs> John Howard, sorry, yeah. And uh, that's been taking a lot of their time uh, lately, uh, just with the logistics involved in that. And it's uh, fairly uh, complex. They're, they're, um, they're two different agencies trying to blend their, uh, uh, not necessarily their workloads, but their uh, ideology and their uh, um, sort of their projects aimed in the right direction so that's that's going quite well but it's probably not going to uh, be totally uh, tidied up till the end of the fiscal year the end of March so uh, uh, they may uh, they may still uh, it was too bad they missed the first intake uh, in uh, in uh, this past year um, I had told them about it but uh, with all the things going on they uh, they let it ride uh, and uh, have gone with their other contributions that have come in. Uh, so um, they, uh, they, they may be first up for uh, 22 here as far as uh, looking for something to uh, keep, help keep them going until the merger actually uh, is cemented in and it's, uh, it's, it's one entity. So here's hoping, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Councilor McConnell, any comments uh, along those lines as well? Uh, I don't have too much to add, uh, Mayor Todd. Uh, Matthew and Mike pretty well summarized things, I think. Um, minor hockey and figure skating is about what we were expecting. I think the bump in the, in the figure skating can be attributed to the fact that we now actually have a rink 
on the horizon. It's not out there somewhere. You can see it started. And I think that's created some excitement in the community and, and uh, our younger people that may have been our parents hesitant to get involved can now see that, uh, that they're going to be able to do that in Prescott before too long. Um, the two, <clears throat> pardon me, the two that uh, we're going to ask to come before council are both very worthwhile groups, but uh, the one being brand new, I think we should uh, hear a little bit about them. And of course, the food bank. Um, that's, that's a big bump from past years, uh, a very large bump. So I think maybe a bit of justification there uh, is in order as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Lee. Uh, open it up for other comments, questions uh, from members of council. Councilor Burton. Thank you, Mayor Todd, and thanks to the working group um, for their dedication on this. Um, I think it's important um, that uh, we look at donating um, some more money towards the spirit of giving. Um, I know um, the Kinsman Club of Prescott are, is hosting um, registration dates starting November 24th. Um, and I see that uh, the Food for All uh, Food Bank is looking for more money as well. I mean, it just shows that people are struggling out there. And if we can do our part just to add a little bit more into the pot, I know the spirit of giving, um, they haven't asked for the money, but I think um, it would be in our best interest to uh, help support them a little bit more. So. I would actually like to make a motion to uh, give them an extra $500 if possible, if I could have somebody uh, else support that. Uh, so Councilor Burton is proposing an amendment to the, to the motion, adding $500 for uh, uh, the spirit of giving. Councilor Young, are you seconding that? Uh... Um, I don't mind seconding it, but um, I think we should know that um, we did give them a thousand in the first intake. Is that not correct, Matthew? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So our normal amount was is five hundred dollars. Last year we bumped that to a thousand. This year we've already provided a thousand. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. But uh, but certainly. The other the other point that I I did discuss with Matthew last week, as a matter of fact. Um, Based on the afternoons that I spent down there last year, um, loading up the, the boxes, um, it occurred to me that perhaps we could donate a bunch of masks. We have thousands of them left. Mm -hmm. uh, we could easily include five or so in every box, um, as well as garbage bags. I think garbage bags become an issue at times and throwing a few of those in every box uh, would not have, uh, going to Prescott residents, obviously, uh, would not be a bad thing. Uh, since there's a monetary value to that, should we include that in the amendment if Councilor Burton's uh, good with that, those additions? Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that we did uh, last year too, Ray, is we, we added some uh, garbage bags in with the spirit of giving. So fantastic idea. So wording on that for, for the, uh, we should set a number of the garbage bags and. Uh... Fortunately, we don't know the number, Brett, because we don't know the individuals that are technically from Prescott. Just to, to be able to, to put this in the, the form of a motion, uh, two bags per uh, per Prescott box. I don't think we need to know more than that. We don't need to know the absolute specifics. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to, um, what was it last year? 250, less than 250 boxes. And you could assume that uh, Two thirds of them are from Prescott, or sixty percent are from Prescott, somewhere in there, maybe. Um, you know, three or four wouldn't be out of question either, Brett. Uh, yeah, that's going to really up the value. That's the that's, and just, just trying to get the bottom line of, of, of that one because you're talking 
where they have buck fifty or buck fifty a bag, three or four per. That's that's going to be more than the, the added cat. That's the value is going to get up to the. I'm going to quickly. Uh, anyways, I just 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 pointed out. I'm not against it. I just just want to point it out. So, uh, Gory, do you had uh, your hand up a moment ago? I uh, just want to clarify. If, uh, we're talking about the Prescott garbage bags, right? That's a word. Yeah. The one, the blue ones. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, that's good. So two, three, four. What? What do you want to put forward as the motion? I would. I would be comfortable putting two, because we don't know. We don't know the factors yet because people haven't registered. So. I'd be more comfortable doing two. Okay, so the motion would read, it was another $500 for Spirit of Giving, two Pre uh, Prescott Town garbage bags uh, to, in each of the Prescott boxes. And I, I, sorry, Ray, was there another? Oh, sorry, uh, masks. We've got lots of masks. So five, at least five per box would be, would be doable. Okay, so I think the wording on that, that amendment should be pretty clear. Lindsay, you've uh, captured all that. Caitlin, we're all good for the wording on that. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? The, the only thing I would add, and it's like Leanne's right, it, it, it's it, spirit of giving is one thing, but, the, but also the food bank's an issue. And I, I don't mind them having to come in and present to get some more information. But at the same time, I think we all know this is going to be a very, I think it's going to be a very tough winter for a lot of people. We're seeing it, the inflationary pressures, food banks. I just read a, a story today on, on food bank usage in Canada overall just skyrocketing. So, you know, I'm all for having them come back, but we're not, we're not, we're, we're meeting December 6th, are we not? That's correct. I got uh, November and uh, December mixed up, but, uh, but certainly it would be the first being in December. See, my only comment on that is it is three weeks. It's not two from tonight. We've got the extra. We've got the extra Monday, uh, the 29th, that we're doing the uh, the service awards at uh, the fire hall. But that's another three weeks for the fire for, for the for the uh, food bank to wait. Anyone else interested in just fronting them the set, like giving the seven thousand tonight without the presentation? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight for this. Uh, because I, I, I don't want to undermine Councillors Ostrander and McConnell, but I am sensitive to what the food bank usage is going to be, so I wouldn't have a problem adding that to the amendment as well. We don't have $7,000. Well, we, we've got 7000 We just don't have it in that specific budget. That's not, that's not a showstopper for us. It's an extra 1400 bucks, depending on what we do with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder group which to me is, they, they, maybe they, I'm sure they're doing great work, but the food bank is right here on the ground. <clears throat> but, oh yeah, if no one else is interested in that with the food bank, that's fine. We'll, 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 we'll put them off till, the, till December 6th then. So they'll come in and present that night. So could I have, uh, uh, we've got the motion on the, on the floor, uh, extending the extra funding for the spirit of giving and the garbage bags and the masks. Uh, I'll call the vote on that amendment. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Any further discussion on the main motion? And Lindsay, I'm doing this procedurally properly correct to just double check so I don't uh, call two votes unnecessarily. So vote on the main motion with that amendment uh, added in, of course, that we just approved. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. And that takes us through uh, the bulk of the meeting tonight. Thanks, everyone, for the great dialogue and discussion. Thanks, staff, for well, we're up to a whopping 116 reports for the year. That's uh, that's a whole heck of a lot of work. So thanks a lot, folks. And we're not done yet. We've got a couple meetings left. So we'll, I'm sure we'll at least crack 120. And that's that's not a record. It's very very close. So. Uh, at any rate, thanks, uh, Matt. You're, we're not near a record there, or uh, I see you're waving the eyebrows a little bit at the. <laughs> I, I certainly don't want to get uh, too many more. It, uh, I think I've had my filler reports for the year. So. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, we all have, but uh, we actually got through them pretty pretty good order tonight. It's only eight thirteen, so thirteen resolutions, nothing tonight. Fourteen bylaws, nothing tonight. Fifteen new business. Any member of council have any new business to bring forward tonight? 
seeing none, uh, 16 notices of motion. Any member of council a notice of motion to present tonight? Seeing none, uh, no mayor's proclamations tonight under 17 and nothing in closed session. So nothing tonight under 18 and 19. Uh, 19, of course, is the space for rising report. 20 is our confirming bylaw 50-2021. That's a lot of bylaws, two folks. Recommendation that bylaw 50-2021 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting held on November 15, 2021 be read and passed, signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed by the seal of the corporation. Could I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Ostrander, seconded by Councillor Young. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. And 21, our motion for adjournment. Could I have a mover? Moved by Councillor McConnell, seconded by Councillor Burton. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone, for a great meeting. A lot of, a lot of good work done tonight. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And we'll see everyone in three weeks. Take care, folks.